Others we sing tonight. sounds 
the blessed angel sings for lo the days are hasting on by prophet seen of old when with the ever circling years shall come the time foretold when peace shall over the earth, the earth its ancient splendor fling and the whole Give back the song which now the angels sing. Little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie Above thy deep and dreamless sleep The silent stars go by Yet in thy dark street shineth The everlasting light the hopes and fears from all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. Why mortal sleep the angels keep Lying at their wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming. But in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us. Oh, Lord, Emmanuel. You may be seated. <clears throat> what child is it? Who laid to rest on Mary's lap in sleeping when angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this thing. 
This is Christ the King, who shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary, which lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding. Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him love, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him in, saith gold and myrrh, come rich and poor to own him. The kings of kings salvation bring. Let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him love, the babe, the son of Mary. My little boy, Ezra, he's five years old, and he loves a good story. And he's getting old enough now that we have been reading not just picture books, but chapter books. And before bed, we have to see if we can solve the crime, catch the, catch the criminal, solve the caper. And he loves to read those chapter books. He curls up on my lap and, another chapter, Daddy. Another chapter, Daddy. Read me another chapter. Sometimes we'll read an entire chapter book at night, won't we? I hear those words, Daddy, tell me a story. I hear those words all the time from my little boys. There's a good reason for that. We all love stories, don't we? Stories have this incredible ability to draw us into them. We're captivated by stories. We love the characters. We love the plot. We love the twists and the turns, the suspense, the drama, the mystery, the intrigue, the successes, the failures, overcoming. Stories surprise us. Stories perplex us. Stories challenge us. Stories make us laugh. And stories have this power to shape us. Stories have this ability to make us feel things deep down. And all of us, when we are listening to a story, watching a story on television, hearing a friend tell us a story, we all want to hear those words, and they all lived happily ever after. Douglas O'Donnell, he's a writer, and he says, Tell me a story is perhaps the most universal of all human impulses. It's no wonder that scripture contains a lot of them. There are a lot of stories in the Bible. In fact, the entire Bible itself is one complete unified narrative. Stories are the most universal form of human 
communication. In fact, our brains are actually hardwired to take in information through stories. An ancient rabbi once said, God loves stories so much that he made people. You see, God wants us to participate in his divine drama. He wants us to weave our story in to his. And so this evening, I'm going to share a story with you. It's a story that you've no doubt heard before, but it's a story that we need to hear again and again and again and again. It's a story that must capture our hearts and souls and shape our lives. Leland Riken is a professor, and he writes this, The power of story, its uncanny ability to involve us in what is happening. Storytellers put us on the scene and in the middle of the action. They pluck us out of our time and place us and put us in another time and place. That's the power of a story. The narrative of scripture has that power to transport us, to pull us out of the pew and place us inside the moment of history. We can imagine ourselves right there in the thick of it, right there in the middle of the action. The divine author is inviting us into the drama of the biblical text. And so as I read this story from God's word this evening, I want you to place yourself inside the action. I want you to imagine yourself on the dusty streets of Bethlehem. I want you to smell the fragrance of the sheep and the shepherds. I want you to see the brilliance of the lights from the star. I want you to hear the bold sound of angels singing. And I want you to hear the cry of that tiny infant who was laid in a manger. I want you to step inside the Christmas story this evening because this isn't like any other story. And it's not just a made up fairy tale. These events really happened. And that's why we are going to step inside the Christmas story and hear it again this evening. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. The story begins with new life, the goodness of God's creation. But it wouldn't take long for the disobedience of humanity to bring about a terrible darkness, a darkness so black and hideous, a darkness so cold and evil that it brought death and destruction like a plague. Thankfully, God's love cannot be overshadowed by darkness. The Christmas story is a story of great anticipation, waiting for God to heal our broken world, a longing for God to for God's light to pierce the darkness and bring wholeness and restoration once again, a longing for these ancient words to come true. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness." In that day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Thankfully, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. This is how the birth of God's son, the light of the world, came about. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. 
the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be... So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the high hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Meanwhile, the news of this pregnancy was met with questions and doubts. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. He did not consummate their marriage until the child would be born. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman war Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who is now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. 
When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone who had ha what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up! Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. The child's birth was surrounded by great darkness. But thankfully, the one, is, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But all, to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Later, when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother, but when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophet had said, he will be called a Nazarene. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. 
Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Jesus gave sight to the blind, healed the lame, raised the dead, and taught the crowds. He brought light into the world. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. It would be impossible to say everything there is to say about this great, great story. But perhaps Jesus can sum it up like this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Stories help us understand the past. They help us cope with the present. And they give us hope for a better future. The story of Christmas ought to shape us. It should move us to wonder and worship. It should move us to trust and obedience. It should move us to commitment and allegiance. It should move us to faithfulness and hope. It should lead us to repentance and to love. The story of Christmas ought to shape us. The question for us this Christmas is how will it shape us? Heavenly Father, Lord, we are astounded as we hear this story again. It's one that we hear every year, but it seems to grow bigger and bigger with each passing moment. The enormity, the magnitude, majesty and splendor of Christ taking on flesh, walking among us, teaching us, loving us, ultimately giving his life for us, being raised and ascended to rule and to one day return and to make all things new. Lord, we need that story. We need it every single day. Help that story shape our hearts and our minds and our souls for your praise and glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand as we prepare, prepare for communion tonight. Your only son sin too high but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God your gift of love thy crucified they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humbled king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love thee, holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod. 
and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood. O oh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. The early church, the first Christians, the first disciples of Jesus, when they gathered together, whenever they gathered together, they would share in the Lord's Supper together. See, they wanted to tell that same, same story again and again and again and participate in it, to enact it, to share in it, to rejoice in it. If you're a believer in Jesus, we just ask you that you come forward as the communion ushers dismiss you row by row to share in this meal and to remember this sweet, sweet story of Christ his broken body and his shed blood. That story wrapped up in this meal, a little piece of bread and a little cup of juice, they'll be stacked together that remind us that the biggest story that ever existed is a true story and gives us hope. Let's thank him for that right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity again today to share in this meal, to rejoice, to lift your name on high, to remember, and to give you thanks. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.
The story of Christmas reminds us that Jesus came down into our world, entered into our brokenness, this sin-soaked world. He entered this world of darkness. And somehow that humble act shines a light that can never be extinguished. Isn't the story of Christmas beautiful and amazing? In just a moment, we will have an opportunity to sing about that beautiful silent night, that holy night when Christ was born, where the light of the world has stepped down into darkness to open our eyes, to let us see the beauty and the majesty and the grace God's love for us in Jesus. Will you stand? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so Silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight, glorious dream from heaven afar, heavenly hosts sing how. the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace Jesus Lord at thy birth Jesus Lord at thy birth Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the light of Jesus that outshines the darkness and that we, as followers of Jesus, share his light with the world. Lord, as we go out from this place and we celebrate the birth of our Savior, help us to continue to shine that light, even in the darkest place, for your praise and your glory. In Christ's name I pray. Merry Christmas, everyone.